Welcome back, everybody. It, it's, it's just amazing to believe that it's it's been almost a year since we started doing these webinars every single week. Uh, and some of you come back just about every single week to see them. And it was at the beginning of the of the lockdown of the, the national and what became a global pandemic that we realized we needed to find new ways to continually reach out and connect with our valuable partners in technical education to share best practices. So we're so very happy uh, that all of you continue to join us for Webinar Wednesday. If you come every week, you know that from time to time, we attack the question or the topic from a little bit different angle. We always get to the point, but we're going to do that today. You know, we are going to start this discussion about teaching and training on heavy equipment using simulation with a discussion about professional bike racing and bike racing and cycling in general. I've been a bike aficionado since I was a kid. And I built my first dirt bike in the basement of my parents' house. Um, and I have enjoyed and loved cycling ever since. This is a photograph of uh, me and a couple other folks. Uh, the gentleman with the jersey that doesn't match the others is uh, a gentleman by the name of Jens Voigt, professional cyclist, competed in the Tour de France 17 times. Uh, I've had the pleasure of spending time with Jens on, on several occasions. We're going to use that picture as the backdrop for a quick discussion about the top 10 epic cycling events that I've ever had a pleasure of being a part of. We'll go through these quickly, but number 10 is climbing Mount Figueroa. This is a mountain in Southern California. And in about 10 miles, you climb 5,000 feet in vertical. So a really, really probably one of the hardest rides I've ever done, uh, but it was absolutely a blast. I did that a few years ago, again, in Southern California. The Buff, Buff Epic, this is one that starts in Boulder, Colorado. And we climb 5,000 feet to Ward, Colorado. And we do that in about 30 miles and then descend 30 miles into down the St. Vrain into Lyons, Colorado, and do another 40 miles out on the, uh, on the foothills and on the plains. And so that ends up being about 110 mile race. I did that three times. Inta, we did this one in Indiana every year. It was a great training event. We would go down there and on a Friday, we would ride 30, 50 miles, Saturday, hundred miles, Sunday, 30 miles, and get a nice solid early season training ride in, in Bloomington, Indiana. Jingle Cross. This is an amazing event in central Iowa. I raced in this uh, back a few years ago. The cool thing about it, it's cycle cross racing, a different style of racing, um, but they have a pro race. And so you get all these amazing riders from Europe and all over the globe that come and compete in that. That was incredible. I did the Bay to Bay three times. The first two were incredible. Actually, all three of them were incredible. That is a ride. It's 205 miles from Whitefish Bay, Wisconsin to Ellison Bay, Wisconsin. Uh, 205 miles. We'd start at about quarter to six in the morning and be done by dinner. So we, we pounded 205 miles in a day. It was absolutely awesome. The Trek 100, I did a, a number of times, probably 10 times. This is a huge fundraiser for Midwest athletes against childhood cancer. And I had the pleasure of competing in that numerous times. It was just, it's just a great ride. I even had the Trek 100 tornado year. That was the year that as we were finishing, there was a tornado warning. And you're at like mile 98 and the, the course marshals are telling you to finish quickly because there's a tornado coming. It's like, well, at 98 miles, I've got one speed and this is it. But that was a great event. Solvang, California to Halama Beach. This is about an 80 mile ride round trip. Absolutely beautiful through the hills and mountains of Southern California. And the beauty of it is you end up on a beach on the Pacific Ocean, probably the best cheeseburger I've ever had in my life. I ate at that beach. And number 10, and these are in no particular order, the Wisconsin Cycling Association Cyclocross State Championships in this is about five or six years ago. Uh, that is a cycle cross season runs in the fall into the late fall. And at the start of that race, it was minus three degrees Fahrenheit and we raced anyway. So that was just absolutely amazing. So why am I talking about epic cycling events at the beginning of a webinar about heavy equipment simulation? Here's why I was a hardcore cyclist, hardcore bike racer for a number of years. And the truth of the matter is that where I live in southeastern Wisconsin, about four months of the year, the landscape looks like this. And you are not training outside on a road bike when the landscape looks like that. And so to train, we used simulation. And it was amazing. You can use, you can track your heart rate. You can track your cadence. That's your, your pedals per minute, pedal strokes per minute, how many watts of power your legs are putting out over a period of time. 
It's a really great way to build up your pain threshold to get used to suffering on the bike. You do intervals, running your heart rate way up, bringing it way back down. You track your performance against others. So those riders that you see in the picture, those are all real people that are riding a simulated bike somewhere else on the planet. And you're tracking and racing against all those people and you do it in a controlled environment. So you can really focus on the parts of your riding. That's a little harder to focus on when you're out on the race course. So simulation is a great way for us to build cycling skills. It is also a great way for us to build heavy equipment and forklift driving skills. Here's why this is important. I worked in manufacturing for 20 plus years, as many of you know. And so I know what it's like to run a fleet of fork trucks, to have a, a whole crew of material movers that are moving equipment and are moving goods and products around my plant. And here is why this is important. If my forklift drivers, for example, aren't trained, number one, that's a safety issue. I run the risk of somebody being hurt because a forklift driver isn't paying attention. So it's really important for us to train on safety. The throughput on my line depends on those forklift drivers getting product to and from the line in a timely fashion. If they're not trained and they're not able to do so efficiently, that can slow down production. Number three, transportation efficiency. So in other words, getting people used to the idea is that you should always have a load on your forks, that no matter where you are in the plant, you should be moving product somewhere that we use the equipment and we use our time efficiently. If somebody isn't trained well, we run the risk of getting the wrong order to the line when it's time to run that order, getting the wrong materials, the wrong product to the line. That creates all kinds of challenges with product quality and with efficiency at the production line. Doc congestion. You do not want to be around a truck driver who has a semi backed up to your plant or is waiting outside your dock when you're not running your dock efficiently because their ability to make money, their ability to service their customers depends on your ability to adequately, safely, and efficiently load and unload their vehicles. And so having people who are not properly trained stands in the way of doing that. Mixing orders. So the last thing we want to do is pick up an order for company A and put it on the truck for company B. But if somebody isn't properly trained, we run that risk. Undoing that problem is a nightmare and I've had to do it. Uh, so mixing orders is something we want to stay away from. Equipment damage. So we run the risk that somebody could damage the forklift if they don't know how to operate it safely or worse yet, or at least just as bad, damage another piece of equipment. I once had somebody take the fork on a forklift and drive it through a 55 gallon drum of hazardous chemistry and watch that chemistry leak all over the floor of the manufacturing facility. So having people who are properly trained in the operation of their equipment helps us avoid equipment damage and other um, issues that can take place in the manufacturing facility. Overtime, if I don't have enough trained people I have people working overtime to make up for the hours that aren't being worked by people on straight time. That gets expensive. That requires me to raise my prices or cuts into my margin and hampers my ability to reinvest in my company. And I can tell you that people can work 70, 80 hours, a couple of few weeks in a row. You try to get them to do that for four or five months at a time. And I've been there. You create employee morale problems. These are all of the reasons that today's topic is so very important. These are all the reasons that we need to make sure that whether it's heavy equipment, a bridge crane, a mobile crane, a front end loader, or a forklift in our manufacturing plant, that our operators are adequately and efficiently trained. And in the same sense that we can use simulation to improve our performance on the bike, we can use simulation to, prefer, to improve our performance on our heavy equipment and to expedite the time that it takes us to train people. Here today, to talk with us about this topic is my friend and my colleague, Ivan Manuel. Now, Ivan is a digital business development executive for ATS Lab Midwest. In that job, he spends a ton of time doing what we're talking about today, showing people best practices in different programs and platforms for training and preparing our students for amazing careers, training and preparing our learners for amazing careers. So that is a huge part of Ivan's job is showing people how we can use these applications to make their life better at work and at school. So Ivan Manuel, what a pleasure it is to have you with us today. Thank you so much for taking some time for the audience. It's great to be here, Matt. Thank you. Absolutely. We're really, really looking forward to this discussion today. I want to start with this. I know you've done some research on the job outlook 
for people that work in these jobs, the material handlers and heavy equipment operators? What have you managed to find in terms of the opportunities and the job outlook in these spaces? Perfect. So let's start with who these individuals are and what they do. Heavy equipment operators are people who are trained to safely maneuver heavy machinery. In some cases, they ensure the proper maintenance of this machinery, as well as display various aptitude for blueprint reading and calculating the appropriate load amount. Uh, this includes everything from forklifts, bulldovers, bulldozers to cranes and excavators. So there's a wide range of application. They use these machines to dig, lift, sand, gravel, or even the earth paving surface. Um, equipment operators use it to spread concrete and asphalt during the construction of roadways. So to answer your question, the job outlook for uh, heavy equipment operators is looking very, very bright. These individuals will continue to fill a needed and desired role within our workforce. Nearly every construction project relies on skilled labor and expertise of heavy equipment operators to keep the project up and running. <clears throat> the demand for these services is expected to remain high. And um, from what I read in the US Bureau of Labor and Statistics, it's actually estimated to grow between 10% between the time span of 2018 to 2028. And to put that into perspective, that's double the average rate of compared to all other occupations. So not just awesome opportunities today for people that are looking at entering this, this career field, but also great opportunities for the next 10 years as we're gonna to continue to see likely a shortage of people who are trained properly to do these jobs. That is great, great news for people that are looking to enter this particular career field. I'd be interested, Ivan, when they get there, what industries are looking for material handlers and heavy equipment operators? Where will these people be working? As I mentioned, there's a growing need for these individuals. Um, so there's a wide range of industries that they can go into, mining, construction, manufacturing, agriculture, warehousing, distribution, forestry, and these are just to name some of them. Excellent. So all kinds of opportunities in a wide variety of careers. And so it doesn't almost really matter what somebody's interest is. There's probably an opportunity in that particular industry to be a material handler, to be a heavy equipment operator. Now we talked in the intro a little bit about some of the challenges of not having people adequately trained. I'd like to build on that by talking about with you, what are the challenges with some of the traditional methods of training people for these career pathways? Yes, um, so based on my research, you know, the main three challenges that it comes back to is labor and retention. That's gonna be the first one that I like to touch on today. You know, with such a high demand for skilled operators, you know, um, employers are finding um, it difficult to find enough people to fill these roles. And this makes training and retention of new talent a high priority for these employers. Having more skilled individual filling these roles is gonna increase productivity, reduce downtime and save them money. Um, safety, that's always a concern when individuals are operating heavy equipment to complete these complex uh, processes. Many construction job sites involve heavy equipment operating in very close proximity to people working on the ground. So that is an even higher concern when we're discussing, you know, um, bringing on new hires and these individuals operating this equipment. Um, the last one I'll touch on to answer your question, productivity. It takes time to onboard and train new employees, especially those who have no prior experience to operating this sort of equipment. You know, training programs will be more produ productive if they had a better way to train more people faster. So access to equipment, productivity, certainly the safety challenges of having somebody who's not familiar with how to operate this, this heavy equipment. Obviously, just looking at that picture, it's pretty clear to us that if somebody didn't know what they were doing, that there would certainly be a, an opportunity to put somebody yeah. in harm's way. So those are just some of the challenges as you share with some of the traditional methods of training. Clearly, there has to be a better way. So what can you tell us about the ways that we can train more efficiently? So what you'll see momentarily, um, based on my research, you know, we're seeing a growing number of training programs utilizing simulation-based training. Um, you described it very, very well in your introduction. And this is really to streamline these processes. Um, heavy equipment falls under that category as well. So these simulation-based training systems, they're professional grade simulators, which they're gonna act as a bridge between the classroom and the worksite environment. They're gonna function you know, with extremely high level graphics. 
in order to make the experience as real as possible. They're going to um, they're going to utilize authentic replica controls, and this is designed by specialists that can verify the application and can verify the relevance. So learners will become familiar on the same equipment that they're going to actually use in the field. It's going to provide um, real time feedback and data. This is the first time ever you've been able to go through a training process and track your understanding of the curriculum as you're going through it in real time. So that's a huge benefit. Curriculum, that's the most important part. And that's going to be accurately reflecting the operation of the equipment, um, fully preparing them to be able to do these complex processes safely on a day to day basis. Perfect. So Obviously, a picture is worth a thousand words and our audience is getting a feel for how this simulation tool can work. And, and clearly, there's tremendous value and a tremendous amount of technology that's packed into that box right there. So as we're looking at a tool like this, Ivan, what can you tell us about the benefits of using simulation for training people for these careers? And, you know, I kind of touched on it briefly um, in the last uh, question, but you know, there's many, many benefits to utilizing this technology. The first is going to, it's going to be a huge time saver, you know, adopting a system like this is going to save you so much time and money when it comes to training individuals. And um, you're going to be able to expedite your training process and even train multiple people at once. So it's going to be faster. Um, safety, that's a huge benefit. You're not going to have to worry about the risk associated with individuals training on this um, equipment. And, you know, your team is going to be able to build confidence as they continue to learn and build upon their base understanding of this equipment. And they're going to be able to do that in an environment that is safe for themselves and the people working around them, you know, and higher engagement. Um, that's that's going to be one of the hugest, the best benefits. Um, you know, your team is going to be able to enjoy the training um, with that the increased engagement is going to ensure that they're more focused to learn the correct methods to operate and make them more inclined to follow the correct procedure on a consistent basis. And it's going to provide them once again with that solid foundation for them to build upon. Um, the last one I'll touch on is the flexibility of the system. The system's completely portable. It has a wide range of application scenarios. Um, so in comparison to training um, an individual on one piece of equipment, um, you can really, really maximize your time and efficiency. So an extensive list of benefits of using simulation for training. I've got to believe that our audience, Ivan, is pretty, pretty excited to actually see a demonstration of the system. I understand that you've got some demos prepared for us. So let's stream those. And why don't you walk through um, what it is that, um, that they'll be seeing here in these demonstrations? Perfect. Um, so what you see on your screen is a scenario progression for the forklift simulation. So we're gonna walk through that shortly. Um, so it, it begins with the individual learning, the basic controls, um, going through the operation of each of the different levers and the gears and the, uh, the steering wheel. And it's gonna gradually introduce them to various tasks an operator would face um, or be expected to complete um, on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, the, the suite, that we're looking at here is made out of 15 modules. It's gonna increase in difficulty as you progress. And the simulation software is automatically gonna track, report um, your results. So a student can really, really train un unsupervised and learn at their own pace. So in the first video, um, this video you're gonna see me navigating a standard load process within a warehousing environment. So Prior to this, I just want to mention, I had no experience operating forklifts. So this was all new to me, all the controls. I had to learn this in real time. So I started with the basic controls in order to familiarize myself. And once I got that down, I began to progress uh, through the content. Each of the videos, you're going to see me operating from multiple angles. Top left angle is going to give you an idea of the control layout that I'm using to control the forklift. Top right is an overhead view. This is just going to give you another perspective of the, the system as a whole. Um, I'm using the basic operator setup, two joysticks, a standard foot pedal, a gear shifter, as well as two monitors, one in the front for the forward view, one in the back for a rear view. Um, so I'm not sure if I mentioned this, but it's simple and easy to change out the controls depending on the equipment or the scenario that you're training on. Excellent. Should we move on to another demo? Uh, yes. Thank you. This next video, this is going to be very, very similar to the first, 
but this is um, managing a wider load. So as opposed to the standard view that we saw in the previous example. Um, so as I mentioned, each module is gonna increase in difficulty as you advance. This one is exactly after the standard process. So it's very similar. Um, at the end of each module, we'll see at the end of this one, you're gonna get a data reference. So it's gonna show you exactly how, um, how long it took you to advance through. It's gonna tell you exactly um, it's going to pretty much measure all of the data that's collected as you go through. If you accidentally bump something, it's going to tell you when and where and how many times you did that. If it's, uh, and it's going to give you a grade. So after you can really, really reevaluate and you can learn from your mistakes. Well, and it looks like if, uh, if this day job doesn't work out for you, which we have every reason to believe that it will, that a, that a future in material handling is, is right there for you, Ivan. This is really, really yes. great uh, watching you navigate through uh, this maze and control that control that load on the front end of the forklift. We're going to move on, I think, to another demonstration that you've got. What are you showing us here? This is the final demo, and this is a little longer one, so I'll just briefly talk about it. Um, so this is an example of how to, you know, operate safely as you're going up and down ramps. And, you know, you don't usually think about this, but with the lift, you know, um, it's very, very easy to scrape the bottom or, or nick something as you're going up. So this module is gonna be very different than the previous two. It's gonna give you um, complete flexibility to take it at your own pace. Um, you'll notice the map at the top center of the screen. Uh, it's gonna um, really give you a good reference point as you continue to build upon your basic skills. And you know it's gonna tell you how to advance within this warehousing space. Um, you'll also notice the section at the bottom by the steering wheel, that's gonna give you um, um, a reference for your tilt you know, what angle the, the forklift is at so you, you know, have a better reference so you're not nicking things as you're going up or down the ramp. Um, this, uh, this scenario in particular, um, if you're unaware of your lifts, you know, you're gonna, you're gonna really um, have to go back through and, and reevaluate. All right, so, so that, that's kind of um, that one, we can move on. Okay, so yeah, by now our audience certainly has a really good idea of the level of technology, how realistic this experience is for the operator, how much it mirrors, in this case, a typical uh, warehousing and, and uh, storage environment. Uh, tell us about the system itself. Tell us about the hardware and, and what actually comprises this, this solution that you're using, Ivan. Thanks, Matt. So this system that I'm using, this is a Simlog's heavy equipment simulator. Uh, the simulator um, is created by um, their team of specialists that work through the process, work through um, with their team of OEM and operators to ensure that um, you know, it's the most realistic and relevant skills that you can um, have as far as um, training on these industrial processes. Um, if you go to the next slide um, here, we can see that um, Simlog, they currently offer 14 different PC-based simulations all of these, they can uh, fall into construction, mining, logistics, material handling, and forestry. And on the right, those are just some more references for the different pieces of equipment that um, they've created very, very immersive simulations for. So we've got a good idea of what the forklift simulation looks like. Are you able to show us what some of these other products and solutions might look like? Yeah, yeah, I, I actually prepared a few videos. Um, this, this first video, this is um, a skid steer loader module. Um, this, is, this module is gonna focus on truck loading. The user will have to drive the skid steer loader to the loading zone, fill up the bucket with the rocks, and then perform a three-point turn to drive the dump truck and dump the rocks uh, into the truck. This process is then repeated and they pretty much do that until there's no more rocks. Um, the simulation would end once all of the rocks are in the truck and then the bucket is empty and it's safely flattened on the ground. All right, what do we see in this one? This next video, this is a crane, a mobile crane personal simulator. Um, and this one is fo focused on pole placement. So I don't think the video is playing, Matt. The learner would be instructed to carefully lift the pole off the ground and then place it in the target hole while avoiding all the different obstacles and making sure that it's stable once you place it in the ground. Um, you'll notice that as it gets closer to the landing zone, um, the zone will change colors. It'll kind of give you a, a gauge on how accurate you're progressing. Awesome. This one takes a little bit longer because you know it's a, it's a heavier piece of equipment. You got to take your time. Sure, absolutely. 
All right. And then what do we have in this one here? This one, this is a backhoe loader simulation. So this one, um, if you, there you go. Um, this one is focused on the bucket positioning as you're, you know, operating this piece of equipment. It's going to require you to drive the loader safely through the obstacles in forward and in reverse. And once you get in position, um, then you're going to actually have to shift your chair and uh, switch um, into the reverse position. And you'll see that in a moment. So this is the view from inside the inside the piece of equipment as opposed to the outside. Fascinating. Yes. And it's interesting how realistic that site looks as well, isn't it? It's very cool. And you know, each each scenario is unique and it's, they're very dynamic. All right. Well, those are great demonstrations. Gives our audience a really, really good understanding, I think, Ivan, of the of the different options that are available. And as you suggested earlier. Uh, many more than just the, the three or four that you've been able to show us today. Um, you know, I think the next question is, as we think about the students and learners, you know, who are the folks that are learning on the system and where can this be taught? Um, so the first I'll highlight high schools. Um, we've seen many examples of these systems fitting great within high school programs. Students love to train on this type of equipment and learn about the various pieces of equipment that they're operating and all the different opportunities that result from, you know, becoming certified in these different pieces of machines. Um, one thing to note is that you can't operate heavy machinery until you're at least 18 years of age. So most students don't even learn about these, these careers in high school. And we know, you know, the earlier we can expose students to new career options, uh, the more opportunities they'll have in the future. Um, technical colleges, they're adopting systems like this into their current programs in order to gain all the benefits of being able to train more students on an extremely wide range of equipment and preparing each learner for success. Um, also, the Department of Corrections, we've seen them utilize this system very, very extensively. Systems like this are being used um, to provide individuals with the resources to receive vocational training while they're serving their time. And upon release, they'll be given you know, more opportunity for employment, and that'll also reduce the risk of recidivism. Excellent. And I've got to believe this has got uh, applications for industrial employers as well and people that are, that are in industry. So we've got our, our high school students, our technical and community college students, uh, students that are going through a, a corrections program and getting ready for re-entry into the workforce and also the workforce itself and industrial employers who are interested in training their learners on this technology. So what a, what a great overview, Ivan, that you've given of this whole world of heavy equipment operation simulation. Melissa, I've got to believe that uh, given that great presentation, we've had some interesting questions come across from our audience. Have we had any audience questions that you want to share with us? Yeah, I mean, the first one I'm going to direct at you is um, this individual noticed that there's, um, as you can see in the picture there, um, there's a whole chair set up, but then there was one that didn't have uh, the big chair, just had some controls on a table. Can you talk about the different options for controls? Oh, yes. Um, so as far as the different setups, there's, I'm sorry. So as far as the different setups, there's a lot of flexibility within the system. That gives you the option to create the perfect setup for your program. Um, the one in the um, picture that you notice, that's more of a, um, that includes the operator chair, which is gonna be the most realistic as far as placement and controls um, and seating position. Um, this option is not as mobile, but it's gonna be the real, um, it's gonna be the most realistic option. Um, the system that I was training on that I used in the demo was a, um, <clears throat> a more um, a basic hand controls and feet pedals. They were all mounted on the desk. Um, that's going to be an extremely portable option. And then each, each um, display can be used with multiple monitors, either one in the front, two, one in the front and one in the rear, or a total of four monitors, three in the front and one in the rear. And that's going to give the user the, the full experience. Awesome, great amount of flexibility there. And uh, just, I think we have time for one more question. Um, Ivan, this individual said, can you show me um, the excavator version of the simulator? Um, I don't have a demo on this presentation, but what we can do is we can just set up a demonstration and I can walk you through all the different um, the options. 
Yeah, absolutely. And we'll we'll make sure in our follow up email to um, include Ivan's email address so that if anyone wants to see a more one on one or see some of the other options that he'll be able to do that with you um, at a later date. So that's all we have for questions. Matt, back to you. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you, everybody, for joining us for a lively discussion about cycling, simulation, and heavy equipment operation. It's been great to have everybody with us here today. I know I learned a tremendous amount from Ivan Manuel, and I'm sure you do. You did as well. I want to make it a point to thank Ivan uh, for the time that he put into this presentation and for the expertise that he has, both as somebody who knows this technology well and, as we saw in the demo, as somebody who has used it and is now capable of operating, in that case, a forklift. So uh, definitely a really, really applicable and timely topic for our audience. Thanks so much for joining us today. Next week, we are going to feature the Industry 4.0 Foundations Program. We've talked a lot about Industry 4.0 learning programs at the high school level, at the technical community college level for our industrial employers. We're going to talk next week about these applications for middle school students and how do we get them prepared to understand smart sensors, smart devices, autonomous vehicles, drone technology, data analytics in a fashion that is appropriate for somebody in that age group, for somebody at that grade level, but also inspires them toward tremendous interest in advanced manufacturing technology. So you won't want to miss that. Mike Dietrich will be our host next week for Webinar Wednesday, and we look forward to having you back then. Thanks so much for joining us.